Sorry for the delay. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. All right, there it goes. Okay, there we go. Ah. Oh, that's my life. Okay. My name is Chris Murray. I'm a red team member at. That's what you get. Uh, I have an OSCP, some IT certs, mind reader, penetration lover, or penetration tester, <laughs> <laughs> Python lover, and my favorite password is your password. All right, so I'm Jake Garley. Um, I'm a penetration tester at Secure State, part of the profiling team, uh, which is the most kick ass pen testing team out there. So we do a lot of good work. I'm an OSCP. Uh, things I am not is uh, SIF, QSA, SysL, LNLP. And I'm not your friend when I'm on your network. My favorite password is password with a bunch of questions. Just to mess with people that are trying to crack my LM passwords with rainbow tables. <laughs> All right, so back on into what we've been doing the research on. The reason why passwords are important, why you should care. Easy back backup. Oh, wow. Easy break-ins. It's relevant across multiple industries. Most companies use Microsoft's default complexity settings, which is actually very weak. Um, Fresh stats, skinny tested, mother approved. All right, passwords are greater than exploits. Everybody talks about exploits this, exploits that. Passwords work across multiple systems. You know, you, users use passwords, and so should pen testers and anybody who's testing their networks. It's cross-platform, it's reliable, and minimal impact as long as you try to stay underneath that lockout threshold. Uh, users are lazy, they share passwords, Multi-factor is expensive, so most companies don't even implement it. And you, know, you, can, and you can access everything that the user can access. Here's why. Passwords give you access to email, VPN, Citrix, intranets, extranets, file shares, databases, and they're almost always connected to AD, Lotus, everything. It's all in one central place. One correct guess, and you see here this is Merck Intruder running. One correct guess can get you access to, change the thing, can get you footholds with uh, Citrix. So now you're on their internal network. That's just one correct guess. Credit card numbers. You see here we got you know Gary's Amex, you know, this other guy's Amex. Great. Social security numbers. This database had it was over, 20, I believe it was over 100,000 social security numbers in it. And more passwords. So this is a password that someone so generously said, you know, hey, this is to our secure FTP server. And users, they're just lazy. And you see here, you know, these, these are a couple Twitter snapshots we took. You know, this guy saying, I hate creating strong passwords. I have the same password for everything. You know, and, and one of our favorites is, where is it at? Oh, this password is weak. I don't care. I want this password. So even password meters aren't helping people pick stronger passwords because they don't care. So users are lazy. And it's just, and this was actually my favorite. Yeah. I actually feel kind of personally insulted when registering on a site and they call my password weak. How about I freaking kill you? I mean, they're, all they're trying to do is help you guys. But a lot of this is about random websites, and random websites, people will pick passwords, anything from one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever. We want to talk about the stuff that impacts the actual corporations. All right, so I've actually talked to a couple other penetration testers from uh, other consulting companies and things like that, and I've heard various things about whether or not they test for passwords or not. Um, one of the most surprising things I hear is that it's actually out of scope. Um, and actually, we feel that if you're not testing for weak passwords or guess old passwords, you're kind of doing your clients a disservice um, because that's something that we use all the time to break in. Um, you know, just having to be out of scope just because a lot of people are afraid, they don't want to get locked out, they're just like, oh, just don't do it. We'll just assume all of our users pick strong passwords. <laughs> Yeah, um, so you don't want to get lockouts. Um, a lot of other penetration companies, um, some others I should say, um, if they just run a vulnerability <coughs> scanner, the only thing they're really testing for is default passwords on network devices, applications, things like that. They don't actually guess weak passwords. Um, and other times they might not know where to start. So we're here to kind of help bolster that and uh, get things going so people can actually assess their security as far as their user password selection. All right. Yeah, we forgot to say um, so what we did, so we obtained hashes from penetration tests against 
organizations and corporate networks. And we're talking, you know, across multiple types of industries and stuff like that. We cracked them to take to test password sharing between applications and non-Windows machine accounts, everything. Circumvent permission controls, and plus it gave us an excuse about CUDA box. And everybody loves that. During the cracking and analyzing process, we used several different tools. We used Kane, Hashcat, Rainbow Crack, Set, Awk, Cut, Grep, everything, Time, and uh, Pipple. If you guys haven't heard of Pipple, it's the best way you can analyze passwords right now, in my opinion. Um, and <coughs> All right. Yeah. So before we actually dive into the stats, what do you guys think is the most common password out there? Just, just go ahead and shout them out. One, two, three, four, five, six. Password one. Password one. We got password one. What else? ABC one, two, three. Summer twelve. What's that? Summer twelve. Season based. I hate company names. A lot of people. A lot of people believe password one capital P, the one at the end because it meets complexity requirements. And as uh, Jake will dive in here, yep. you'll see what it actually is. Yep. So uh, before we actually dive in, just a little disclaimer, this data is presented as is. Um, you know, draw your own conclusions from it. Uh, it does not account for any active or disabled or locked accounts because when we get obtain the hashes, we don't really correlate that information with the actual validity of the account at the time of the, the compromise. So um, it also does not take password policies into account. Um, however, it is most corporate environments. So what you'll see here is most of the time it's going to be <coughs> seven or eight characters around that time. Um, and then uh, companies with larger user bases may skew the stats. Um, a lot of organizations will have a default password for their help desk or something like that, or for new employees, they'll set it up, and they'll just pick one thing for their organization. So companies that have a lot more users than, than, other, than other companies, um, they might skew some of the stats. And then uh, also passwords containing company names or any variations thereof, acronyms, things like that are gonna be removed. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit at the end, but we didn't obviously wanna attribute anything back to our clients. So, um, diving into the stats, overall stats, we uh, took the uh, password hashes from 37 different companies across multiple industries. Uh, the uh, total number of accounts that we compromised was about 160,000. Um, and then uh, the ones that we actually cracked was about 85% of that. So, just using the tools that you mentioned earlier, we were able to tear through it. Um, again, big thanks to the Team Hashcat and for those guys because that, that tool rocks. Um, total unique passwords out of the 134,000 that were actually cracked there's only about 72% of that. So obviously there's some commonalities between the way people think and the way they pick their passwords. You get the same password all the time. I mean, this isn't new to you guys. Um, I'm sure you guys, it makes sense. Um, and then also we had uh, 961 where the username is the same as the password. So I know a lot of other penetration testers out there, they'll pick, uh, they'll guess like things like password one and then the username is the same as the password. Oftentimes that doesn't always make sense because sometimes the username is all lowercase or all digits where the username doesn't actually fit the complexity requirements. So it's always worth a shot, but we got other ways to get around that. All right, <clears throat> so we kind of started this uh, information uh, gathering uh, back in 2010, uh, quarter four. So we really didn't know what passwords were good at the time and we wanted to try and find out more about it to leverage it moving forward. Um, and as you can see, here, this is just a Q4 of 2010. I mean, it's just seasons all day, every day. So, I mean, you definitely see the password up there. That's definitely one of the more common ones as well. You know, but a lot of times if people pick password one, they'll increment to password two, password three, every time they have to change your password. So, season based is basically the main thing that we've uh, discovered here. Um, and with season based, the person can actually change when fall comes along, right on change to fall. Because with that ro password rotation that most companies require you to do, it's going to be there. You're going to be, you know, oh, time for me to change my password. Oh, it's winter time. Yep. And that's the beauty of it is, I mean, most companies rotate their passwords every 90 days, which is exactly the same as the season. You know, the year doesn't duplicate because next year it's going to be a different number. So technically you're never reusing the same password, therefore preventing, you know, password reuse. As you tell, summer's a hot one. Yeah. Yeah. Summer's like, like you said back there, it falling exactly where we, where our data suggests. Right. So kind of moving on to first quarter, uh, we actually didn't have that many seasons in quarter one. Um, but we did have password that did show up, um, you know, several times. And another thing too is, if you can see here, you'll see things like Christmas time and week. 
um, and things like that. So you did see the ABCD one, two, three, four. I don't know when you guys back there had something like that. Um, so yeah, we definitely see that as well. Um, and it's something that didn't really come out super strong with stats, but holidays are great, especially around the end of the year, because there's a lot of holidays around that time. Um, people don't really pick things like, uh, you know, St. Patrick's Day or Valentine's. We need a little bit of that, but you know, Thanksgiving, things like that. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So some more of the stats. Um, obviously, this is summer or uh, quarter two of 2011. So right around that time frame, you're going to see spring 11. You know, summer 11. And that's why the base words keep so going up. The trail offs of winter. Yep. Yeah, you have, you know, so spring start to come into effect, so people are starting to use the password. And you can see here, you know, these, obviously these here are where there's complexity is not enforced. Um, we didn't have enough time to divide the two. We would love to eventually do a talk where it is only about people who are using complexity. Yep. Um, but that's a lot more data. Yeah. Um, and you can see here, it depends on the length of the, the word, too. You know, spring 2011. So you can tell most likely that company's password requirement length is longer than most other companies. Right. So quarter three, summer, another again, another base word that came up. Um, it didn't show up on the left uh, as far as the top passwords, but it is still a very common base word. Um, I mean, that's, I mean, uh, this one actually had a lot more username the same as the password, most likely because whatever organization we analyzed at the time had, you know, a, <coughs> set up that way where new users or disabled users or something like that. So again, kind of an, a way to kind of skew the stats. Whereas before we had six that had users passed, this one has a lot more. <coughs> All right, so quarter four, 2011, um, again, winter, uh, password one. Password one did show up there. So it's we don't say don't use password one. That's definitely one of our go-to passwords as well. Um, the main thing we're trying to highlight here is obviously season and year. So this year, same thing, fall 2011 from the trail end, winter 2012, because probably most likely people change their password in January, so they had 2012, whereas you know you wouldn't really expect that because we're not quite towards winter 2012 yet. One thing I also like to point out is as you move from 2011 to 2012, you start to see a difference. And I fully believe that companies are starting to become more aware of password policies. So in quarter one of 2011, you saw very few long, strong passwords. And as you prog as we progress through the stats, you can see co companies are starting to develop and actually create longer passwords or enforce the default Microsoft complexity requirements at least. So, right. Um, so I mean, this one, uh, just this summer, or the last uh, quarter two of 2012 this year, um, we're still seeing, obviously, seasons way above the password. Um, as you can see there in the middle column, as far as base words go, um, people pick seasons because they're lazy. All right, so this is actually current. Some of this data is actually from within this last month, too. And uh, as you can see, people's mindset hasn't changed at all in the last you know two years since we've been collecting this data, pretty much. Uh, and this is something we use on pen tests all the time. It's funny because we've been at other talks throughout the uh, throughout the weekend, and everyone's saying password one, password one. Yeah, that's great. But what happens when they have to change their password and they can't use it anymore? So it's definitely good to. Be able if it, to if that. it's default, but in the organization where help desk resets the password, and it, uh, your password's password one for ease of use, odds are, odds are they're going to change it. They're going to be required to change it, and they're probably going to change it to a season. So yeah. And actually, when we've been doing this too, is something else besides seasons and password, we've seen that the most common days are Monday and Friday. Like Monday one, Friday one happens quite often through here. So as you can see on this slide, Friday and Monday are both in there in the top base words as well. Um, so those kind of came forward, which is something we didn't really expect when we started doing this analysis. Um, so passwords based on company name. So we took the ones that actually had company name or some sort of correlation to the organization that we actually cracked, um, just to show you guys which ones, if you're going to guess something, if seasons didn't work out for you, uh, which ones you would actually want to select. And the most common one is going to be uh, company name plus one, two, three, or one, two, three, four at the end, depending on the length of the company name. Typically what we're going to do is we're always going to assume eight character <coughs> minimum with complexity and a three character, or a three attempt lockout, and we assume that we're not going to go through that within at least a day. Obviously, as a pen tester, you don't want to cause business impact and just run every password against it. It's locking people out of bed. So another one is to company name plus the year, two digits for the year or four digits, depending on length as well. Um, again, 
because some company names are shorter, obviously. Yeah, and we find, like we said, users are lazy. They're going to take the shortest path. If your company name is six characters, they're only going to append two. So the odds of guessing a password and actually compromising a system with these types of things is taking the path of least resistance. And uh, so if, you know, if season's the first shot, you know. All right, so overall statistics. So besides dividing it by quarter, we put all of them in one big word list, ran people against it, which again, thanks again to Digi Ninja, uh, Robin Wood. Um, we were doing all this by hand until he released that, so we definitely appreciate his work. Uh, overall statistics, summer is by far the best one, above password. Um, and then winter and spring. The reason fall doesn't show up on this list is because typically in fall, people are torn between picking fall and the year or autumn. So right now, typically, we'll generally go towards fall 2012 is more common than autumn 12 or something like that. Um, so that's why it doesn't show up on this top 10 list here. Um, again, overall length is going to be eight characters. That's 42% of all the passwords we cracked. So right there, that's uh, pretty straightforward. I mean, how many of you have uh, organizations where your password requirement is at least eight characters or exactly eight characters? And the other thing, another reason that's actually pretty high is some corporations that actually have single sign-on with uh, AS 400s or other mainframe, they can't actually support more than eight characters. They have to be exactly eight characters. So if you actually integrate those two systems together between AD and, uh, and mainframes, the users are stuck. They have to pick an eight character password, which is great for us, but it's really kind of more difficult to provide a recommendation saying, hey, you know, you need to enforce stricter password complexity requirements and they're just kind of stuck. So they're stuck looking for like a third party solution to implement more control around not picking dictionary words or repeated letters and things like that, um, which again can be costly as well. So um, as you see, I mean, so straight down the list, I mean, the base words are important because that tells us that, you know, the users are picking a variation of those words. Base words stress, you know, summer, password, winter, spring. So if you're trying to guess from, let's say 10,000 users or let's say 5,000 users, if you're trying to pick a password that every one of those other people are going to get, depending on the time of the year, these are going to be your best odds to actually compromise the system. And we do focus this towards penetration testers. If you're a penetration tester and you're not using, and when you're, if you're not brute forcing first off, doing reverse brute forcing where you're actually picking one password going against multiple usernames, and you're not using seasons, like the gentleman back there said, which I very much applaud you for. That's great to hear someone else doing the same thing that we are. Um, you're, you're missing out because, I mean, once you get an OWA, you know, or any type of email, we tend to use the email because it has a higher user base. So we can know if we're starting to get on the right patterns. So, and the the base words are huge. So you start, oh, summer, summer 11, summer 12, summer 1, you know, start to use variations of those and you're going to start getting into accounts on a regular basis. And the users just pick these things because that's well, all they can do. They don't, they don't know any better. Or they don't care. Right. Um, so and this is actually the next tool, the next ten as well. Um, for overall stats, we figure it'd be good to provide at least a little more in the top ten. So as you can see here, the, the spring, summer, winter on the left side, uh, and then fall did make it in the top base words, um, but it's not quite as high as the other seasons. Um, and if you're lucky enough to come across a, a place that doesn't care about lockouts, where you can actually tell there's no lockout, you can run this. You can go against these things all day, and you're going to compromise so many accounts. Right. So using what we learned, you know, so how do you put this stuff to use? So now that we know that, you know, first you need to identify a username schema. You need to know the username schema because the more surface area you have, the odds are your odds go up. So you know, you know look at look for metadata, you know, developer comments, email addresses, guess, Google, you know, create a usernames list. Create a generic list from census. I can't tell you how important it was for me to have this list of the top 50 most common last names. And in front of it, put A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and start with, you know, so A Smith, B Smith, and just roll with that. I can't tell you how many times that was so successful with using a password of summer 11, summer 12, winter, you know, and, and password 1. We don't want to discredit password 1, but the odds are higher that somebody is using, because everybody tells them password is bad, using password is bad. So those people are getting smarter, and they're going, we'll use summer 11, summer 12. Um, so create that, normalize it, and remove your duplicates. Pick the target with the largest surface area, email clients. Once you get into the email, you can take that same password and try it against Citrix, VPN, or an extranet. 
Because once you get that, you know, you got a successful authentication, now you can try it there. The reason why we, like I said before, the reason why we say pick the biggest service area, because everybody has email. Everybody may not have access to Citrix. So if you're brute forcing against Citrix, you could be missing out on possible compromises. And possibly where somebody like picked, oh, I'm just a low level user and I picked, you know, with a summer 12, for that's for my email, but they have a special account for, you know, whatever. But um, and perform a username brute force. Methodology is pretty simple. We got about four minutes. Um, you know, metadata, get it from FOCA, Jigsaw, comments, everything. Pick your password, season plus the year. Two digit year, depending on the length of the password. Password one, and the company name, one, two, three, or like we said before, whatever. And pwn shit. And we're back here where you see, you know, and this was actually into a Citrix auth. And we can see there we got the, the, the Citrix successful login. And we're going to see, you know, the same stuff we saw before. Remediation. Now, this talk, we had originally submitted it for an hour long talk because we really wanted to get into remediation for you guys. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time. So, to be honest, not our problem. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you how many times we've been on a conference call, a uh, closing meeting call or something with a client and saying their their first question is, so you broke in by guessing a username and guessing a password and then leveraging that to get a full internal compromise over the internet. And they're like, yeah. So special thanks to DerbyCon, obviously, security profiling team, Spencer McIntyre. Making up badass password for database. Yep, Megan, he's the one that controls the database that we used. Team Hashcat, Digi Ninja for writing uh, Pimple, and users with weak passwords. Love you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, any questions, you can contact me at Fanlair. I also run a blog, infosexy.com. And yes, that's like sexy. Um, and <laughs> you can hit Jake up at uh, Yager. Yager. That's right, so what I call you. Yeah, you stuff. So that's all we got. Thanks that's for it. coming out, guys. Any questions? We got like three minutes. Any questions? Out of the 37 companies you saw, how many uh, were using LM hashes? <laughs> actually, quite a bit. People are still using LM cool. a lot. Yeah. That's why Kane was actually like first on our list because even if they have migrated over to NTLM, if the users haven't changed their password, they're still using LM, and we can take those. The, you know the password that people pick with LM and just run it again as a dictionary and make lab to get the rest of them too. So yeah, so quite often, I mean, it's you know still widely in use. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, do some of the questions make poor passwords that much stronger? Uh. Because I feel like a lot of them ask questions that are comparatively easy to find the answer. Right. You, you tend, when people implement security questions, you tend to like, what's your favorite food? I got news for you. Most people's favorite food is pizza. Or ice cream. <laughs> ice cream. Uh, what's your favorite color? Most people aren't going to pick aquamarine. They're going to pick red, blue, black. Uh, so it doesn't help. And the other thing we'll find is sometimes with security questions, they'll actually use one of the security questions as their password. So, any other questions? Anybody? No? Good. Great. Thank you for coming. Really appreciate it. Hope you guys well, learned guys. something, take something away from it.